You've probably heard of the 22 immutable laws of marketing, but the real question is, do you really know how to use them to gain an advantage for your business? In this video, I will not only explain the 22 laws to you, but also tell you which ones you need to apply based on your market situation. I promise that by the end of the video, you'll know how to use these laws better than 99% of the entrepreneurs out there. In fact, in the final part, I'll add some extra nuggets that aren't in the book, but that I've learned through experience, courses, and consultations. These tips have cost me tens of thousands of dollars. The authors of the book gave us 22 valuable principles, but they didn't provide the exact recipe for applying them. You need some experience to do that well. Many people use these laws superficially and don't gain any real advantage. However, if you use them correctly, you'll stand out from the competition and attract the right customers for your business. We'll start with the basic concepts by first introducing the laws that apply to everyone, regardless of their market position. The first concept is that marketing isn't a battle of products. It's a battle of perceptions. This is the law of perception. You might think that marketing's role is to make the best products known. And if you do it, you win. But that's an illusion. There is no objective reality about which products are the best. There are only customers' perceptions. Perception is the real reality. There's a famous example of Coca-Cola. At a certain point in its history, threatened by a Pepsi campaign about taste, Coca-Cola launched New Coke, a new formula that, based on 200,000 taste tests, was found to be more enjoyable than Pepsi. But no one bought New Coke, and Coca-Cola had to quickly bring back Coca-Cola Classic. The taste was one thing, but the customer's perception was another. Customers had already associated Coca-Cola with the classic taste. This leads to the central concept of the book, described as the most powerful concept in marketing, owning a word in the mind of the potential customer. This is the law of focus. If a company can own a word or a concept in customers' minds, it can achieve great success. It's the concept of market positioning, placing yourself in the customer's minds in relation to something. A company can't be known for everything. It must narrow its focus to something specific and strive to ensure that when potential customers think of that thing, they associate it with the company. For example, Volvo is one of many car brands. But when you think of safety in the car world, you think of Volvo because it owns that word. Focusing on something goes hand in hand with another law, the law of sacrifice, which says you have to give up something to get something. An example is FedEx. It has become a bit more scattered now, but once it was very famous because it owned the concept of next day delivery. It had sacrificed promoting itself as a courier handling all kinds of shipments, but if you needed an urgent delivery, you went with FedEx. In doing this, the law of candor can also help. If you admit a negative quality, the potential customer will give you a positive. It's interesting to note that if you criticize your business, it is accepted as true. Whereas if you speak in enthusiastic terms, people are at least doubtful. However, if before talking about a positive aspect, you admit a flaw, people will tend to believe you. The example here is Listerine mouthwash, which was criticized by a competitor for its bad taste. Instead of denying it, they acknowledged it. Thanks to this admission, customers saw sincerity in Listerine and believed their positive claim that their product killed many germs. As you can see, these laws are ways to create an advantage over the competition. This is explained by the law of singularity, which says that in every situation, only one move produces substantial results. The point is that competitors often have only one weak spot, so your marketing efforts must focus on that. And with this, we come to the specific laws based on market position, with the law of the ladder, which says, the strategy to use depends on which rung of the ladder you occupy. Ideally, everyone wants to be the market leader, but not everyone can be. So we divide the market players into three categories. The leader, the second, and then everyone else. Let's start with the leader. The first law for market leaders is the law of leadership, which says it's better to be first in the market than to be the best. Many try to convince customers that they have the best product or service, but honestly, everyone says that and the customer doesn't believe it. It would be much more productive to create a new market category or take an existing one without a perceived leader and focus your marketing efforts on being perceived as the first in that category. The first is remembered, the others are not. 
Who was the first person to walk on the moon? Almost everyone knows it was Neil Armstrong. And the second? Few remember. When a company manages to be perceived as the first, it's set. Often, the company's name even becomes synonymous with the category or a verb. Nutella is the world leader in chocolate spreads to the point that chocolate spread is often simply called Nutella. Google is the leader in search engines, and often instead of saying search this on Google, people just say Google this. At this point, you might say, hey, but Google wasn't the first search engine in the market. That's true, and this is where the law of the mind helps, which says, it's better to be first in the mind of the consumer than first in the market. Yes, because even if you enter the market first, but few people know you, it doesn't matter. What counts is who becomes first in the customer's mind, not who enters the market first. To become a leader, you need a certain media presence and notoriety. Honestly, the bigger the market in which you want to position yourself as a leader, the more resources you need. So if you don't have them, either you find them or aim to become the leader of a more niche market segment. You should understand that when the leader manages to position itself first in the customer's mind for a certain word or concept, it is very difficult at that point to displace them unless the leader itself makes mistakes. Success often leads to arrogance and arrogance to failure. This is the law of success. This law goes hand in hand with another, the law of line extension, which states, there are irresistible pressures to extend the value of a brand. Basically, when a leader is successful, they tend to believe that everything they do will be a success and that putting their brand everywhere will bring more success. So they start offering more and more products under the same brand violating some of the basic laws we've seen earlier, like the law of focus and the law of sacrifice. For example, you see companies like Google, which wanted to enter the world of social networks with Google Plus and closed it in 2019. Or Harley Davidson, which at one point launched a line of men's perfumes, later withdrawn. Certainly, a well-known brand will give an initial boost, but in the medium and long term, extending the line only weakens the brand even in its main market. Okay, so we've seen that the leader, unless they make mistakes, will rarely lose their position. So if you're second in the market, are you doomed? No, but you need to use the right laws, starting with the law of the opposite, which states, if you're aiming for second place, your strategy is determined by the leader. It's pointless to try to convince people you're the leader or the best in a category that already has a perceived leader. Customers know that's not true. What you need to do is understand the essence of the leader and position yourself as the opposite. For example, Pepsi had Coca-Cola as the market leader, the traditional drink founded 100 years earlier. So Pepsi positioned itself as the drink for the younger generation. It didn't create a new category. It took Coca-Cola's category and used the other laws we discussed earlier, sacrificing the traditional customers and focusing on the young, the opposite of the leader. This approach is also supported by the law of exclusivity, which states that two companies cannot own the same word in the customer's mind. For example, the market leader in fast food is McDonald's, which owns the word fast food. Burger King didn't succeed when it tried to position itself with the same word. It was already taken. So what word should Burger King take to go in the opposite direction? A good question answered by the law of the attribute. For every attribute, there is an opposite and effective attribute. Sometimes it's easy to find a valid opposite attribute. Other times, it's not, like in the fast food example. The opposite of fast food is slow food, but that wouldn't work for Burger King. Looking closer, you see how McDonald's focuses a lot on kids and fun. So, going in the opposite direction, you could target an adult audience. And for the record, slow food has actually been taken as a concept by an organization that promotes local foods and traditional cooking, choosing to position itself directly opposite fast food, which is considered junk food. So far, we've also seen the main laws for the second player in a category. And if the second does things right, they will have their space in the market. For the others, the situation is a bit different in the long run due to the law of duality, which says that over time, a market will become a two horse race. The majority of the market will eventually be dominated by the leader and the second. So what can the others do? If they try to compete in the same broad market, they're doomed. They need to use the law of the category which says, 
If you can't be first in a category, create a new category where you can be first. Nowadays, the broader categories are practically all taken, so smaller competitors need to be smart and specialize by creating a different category or subcategory where they can be the leader. For example, Red Bull didn't compete in the large and crowded soft drinks market, but created the energy drinks category. At this point, the law of division tells us that over time, a category will divide into two or more categories. And indeed, you see more and more products and market niches. Now I'll speed up a bit to wrap up the laws and move on to the nuggets I promised you. So far, we've covered 16 laws. The remaining ones are related to the implementation of marketing programs. The laws of unpredictability and failure tell us that no one knows the future for sure, so failure must be accounted for when trying to position the company. In such cases, you need to be flexible and change your approach by acknowledging the failure. However, before declaring a campaign a failure, you must consider the laws of resources and perspective, which state that to gain a position in the customer's mind, it takes many resources and some time for campaigns to take effect. The law of acceleration says that the most successful programs are built on market trends rather than passing fads. And this is easy to understand for anyone seeking lasting success. Lastly, the final law is the law of hype, which says that the situation is often the opposite of how it appears in the press. Successful programs are naturally successful among people. If something is overly hyped, it's usually an attempt to compensate for a failure with big budgets to fix the situation, as in the case of New Coke mentioned earlier. Now that you've seen all the marketing laws, you're ready for the advanced tips and observations I promised. First, let me ask you a question. If you position yourself as an ice cream shop with a thousand flavors because your positioning idea was to be known as the shop with the most variety, but because among those thousand flavors, you also make very strange ones, customers know you as the crazy ice cream shop. What is your positioning? If you answered the crazy ice cream shop, you're correct. Many think their positioning is what they say it is. But remember, what counts are the customer's perceptions and the words that enter their minds. With your positioning work, you can only influence how your customers perceive you. If you do a good job, they will perceive you exactly as you want. But if they perceive you differently, a wise choice is to align with that positioning, if it makes sense. For example, Duolingo positioned itself as an easy and fun way to learn languages. But then, the internet started joking about how Duolingo was pushy in making you do the lesson. Duolingo rode the wave by embracing the idea that they are good at motivating you to keep studying, and now they even make ads with the mascot coming to find you at home if you don't do the lesson. Since you understand that positioning is the expression of what you do and sell, not necessarily what you say, the problem arises of how to position yourself when you're a startup starting from scratch. The advice here is not to make the positioning too narrow, but to leave it a bit loose. The point is to see which audience categories react best to your offer and how they perceive you. Only when you have data on the type of good customers can you narrow the focus of your positioning. Moving on to the third point, I can tell you that I've seen many people who associate marketing positioning with the tagline. They want to have their logo and then that little phrase under the logo that explains what they do and their differentiation. Once they've done that, they're happy and think they've done the positioning. That's not your positioning, and you're just wasting time. True positioning is the whole context you create around your product or service that makes you be perceived in a certain way. The most famous ice cream shop in Germany is really called the Crazy Ice Cream Maker. But it's not just a name or a tagline. He has created stores with strange designs, playing on the distortion of the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland. He dresses in a very eccentric way, creates strange ice cream flavors like sausage or mozzarella and basil ice cream, and makes the zero-calorie popsicle, which is just a piece of ice. It's the whole context that matters. Many mistakes and confusion also arise from the concept of line extension. In the laws mentioned earlier, the authors describe how releasing many products under the same brand is the number one mistake companies make. For this reason, many are terrified of making this mistake and therefore do not enrich their offer and stick with a single product, greatly limiting their upsell and cross-sell opportunities to customers. The point is that if you have multiple products, 
It's indeed a mistake to market all of them indiscriminately. What you should do instead is create marketing icebergs. By this, I mean marketing the product visible to customers and creating a good positioning for it. You need to focus to avoid confusing people. Then, once they've come in, customers discover what they didn't see before. Now that they've become customers and entered your world, you can offer different products that are synergistic with the first and help the customer in their journey with you. Instead of thinking about having multiple products, think about how to have multiple marketing icebergs and create specific positioning for each iceberg tip you have. Many wonder whether they should position the company or the individual products. It depends on the type of company you have. If you have a single product company, it's better to unify the product name with the brand name and do a single positioning. An example could be Slack, the productivity tool. If you have multiple products all at the same level, for example, if you have a cookie company where the various types all go on the supermarket shelf, in that case, it's better to position the entire company and only later, if needed, position the best products individually as well. If you have sequential products like a marketing agency, it's better to use the iceberg strategy I explained earlier, positioning the single or multiple icebergs. For example, initially, you could position yourself with a product to help dentists get more clients. Once you've acquired the dentist as client, you then explain that you have other services like brand management, client retention services, etc. Finally, remember that the strategic positioning work you do isn't something you do at the beginning, write on your website and brochure, and then forget about. The positioning you define must be constantly communicated and reiterated in your marketing communications, emails, videos, etc. You need to always find different ways to insert the central concept of your differentiation to influence customers and be remembered for what you've chosen. And this is a process that takes time. It does not take one second like writing a sentence on your website's homepage. These positioning concepts are the basis of most current marketing thinking, which involves narrowing your focus and influence in the market, increasingly targeting narrow niches. It's definitely a valid approach, but it's not the only one, far from it. In fact, if you notice, the companies that change market dynamics don't create a smaller niche in an existing market, but create a completely new market and do so by broadening their focus. I'll talk about this in the next video in this strategy series, which will appear here as soon as it's ready. Don't miss it because it will blow your mind. In the meantime, if you missed it, here's the link to the strategy playlist. To the founder's success.